Hello, this is Peter Baxter, Editor of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. I'm delighted to introduce this podcast. In it, we'll be discussing the paper, Intense Imagery Movements, a Common and Distinct Pediatric Subgroup of Motor Stereotypies, by Robinson, Woods, Cardona, Baglioni and Hedley, which is in the December 2014 issue of the journal. It's going to be discussed by Dr. Sally Robinson, who is a pediatric clinical neuropsychologist at the Children's Neurosciences Centre, Evelina London Children's Hospital, Guy's and St. Thomas's Trust, London, UK, who is one of the authors, and Professor Roger Freeman, Senior Child Psychiatrist at British Columbia Children's Hospital, Vancouver, Canada, who's also written a commentary on the article. Please can we start with you, Sally, to outline the paper and its background. Yes, so this paper is describing a group of children that we've seen who presented at the clinic. They were first identified by Dr. Tammy Headley, who's the neurologist who runs our clinic over the past few years. And they're children who get referred to us because they're presenting with stereotype movements. Often that's not the the actual referral. But what we've kind of found is that in addition to the stereotype movements, when you question them, they're actually going into their own minds and engaging in kind of acts of imagery or imagination where they're recalling being in video games or watching television programs or creating their own television programs based on things they've seen, so like Doctor Who characters. And then the movements are kind of co-occurring at the same time. And these children seem to engage in these episodes predominantly when they're bored or unoccupied, so often when they're walking to school or doing assembly or in the car. And the reason they seem to evoke concern in our parents particularly is because during these episodes the children look quite vacant the movements are a kind of complex stereotype, so they look a bit unusual. And the children get quite annoyed and quite frustrated when you try to call them out of it. And the reason we think it's so important is because a number of children have come through who have had unnecessary medical investigations, so if had children diagnosed having epilepsy, when actually what they're doing is engaging in these kind of stereotype movements with imagery. So this is our kind of first article, just describing these children. What we found here, and obviously in the centre in um, La Sapienza in Rome as well, and we've kind of used the term intense imagery movements to describe them, but we think it's a subtype of complex motor stereotypies. And so this is just our article, just trying to bring to the forefront the fact that in addition to the movements, we also perhaps need to be considering the cognitions and what's going on in terms of the thinking processes as well that might be driving some of these complex movements for, for children during development. Well, I had uh, quite an interest in this publication and others in the field, I should say initially that one of the problems is that the field itself has been rather a mess. The definitions, the names used, even the terminology we're using, stereotypic movement disorder, versus some of the uh, terms used by neurologists typically talking about primary complex motor stereotypies and so on, is confusing. And it's a very heterogeneous group which um, sometimes in the writing about it includes such patterns as bruxism and other uh, body-focused repetitive behaviors. So there's the problem of who is in this rough group that we've talked about. I quite agree that there is a group with intense imagery, although that has not been emphasized by some of the writers. My main concern about this small group is that there's no follow-up into later life, especially into the concept of intense imagery causing problems for adults. Now, we do have some follow-up into adult life, but certainly not so far enough, and that creates the main difficulty. In my commentary, I outline some of the subgroups which I feel are important, and I think one of the indications to me of the heterogeneity of the groups that are being described is the observation, uh, Sally, in your group, Mm -hmm. that the children have not disclosed their thoughts during the movements to their parents. So the parents are surprised when this study was done and such ideas were elicited. We do not find this to be typical. In fact, when we see the children, the parents already have had indications from their children that they are having intense fantasies, often of a creative type, sometimes repetitive, Mm -hmm. and that this makes them happy. So I don't quite understand the nature of this difference, which seems to me quite important. I think the 
questions that you use to elicit the feelings and experiences are very good and useful. So the heterogeneity of the group is a problem, and the various types of follow-up in different studies, including this oh. and our study, are also problems for the description of this group. And the other one which is implied because some of the cases turned out to have autistic spectrum disorder, which is, in our experience, the major confusion initially. Mm -hmm. Children are mostly referred not for epilepsy, although that does occur rarely, but typically for either autistic spectrum disorder or a tick disorder. And in mm -hmm. fact, that's how I got into this entire area of stereotypic movement disorder was that children were seen who were thought to have ticks, but the ticks were either not ticks or were atypical. I, I completely agree with all of your points there. If I just kind of start off thinking about the heterogeneity of the group, I think one of the things is where our children have been referred to. So it's a movement disorders clinic, and typically the children will get referred to possibly for a tick disorder or stereotypies or or possibly even epilepsy. The ASD one's less so because we have a specialist ASD clinic where, where many of those children will go. So some of the children have then been referred into our clinic to think more about the movements and the kind of stereotypies. And I think whilst originally we thought perhaps ASD might not be a feature that would be comorbid with children engaging in these intense imaging movements, the more children that we've seen have virtually doubled our sample since we kind of published this original article. Is that actually, it seems to co-occur in some children with ASD and some children without. We don't actually think that's a defining feature. So one of the reasons we called it kind of image movements rather than imagination movements, which is how we originally referred to it, was to try and, and tease apart that distinction for children with autism. Because actually, whilst they might not have very good imaginations in terms of putting themselves in the context of something else, actually they, they can recall imagery and, and I think that's what we're kind of seeing in these children here is that actually they're recalling episodes and things that they've already seen or experienced and then building on that in a creative way rather than them being the actual subject in the, in the episode and pretending they're something something unique. Well, that's our experiences from talking to the children. And I think it is very interesting that many of your children have told their parents and the majority of us haven't. We have, like I said, had a few more children come through recently and, and some of them have spoken to their parents about this and their parents are aware of their episodes but there's one child in particular who stands out in my mind so she's the child who's she's 12 years old now and she's had these movements since she's about four or five she was misdiagnosed with epilepsy for about four years where she was treated on medication and also at this time her parents were aware that she's engaging in these imagery episodes these imagination episodes and they named them they called them her fiddle time but at the same time, they were still having these ongoing investigations for the movements and, you know, this ongoing treatment for epilepsy, which actually was incorrectly diagnosed. I completely agree that our group is, is very varied and, and perhaps trying to find tune down who can be included in that group might be important. But I think it's more important to perhaps try and consider actually what are the underlying cognitive processes and what might be contributing to this. Because we know actually in a lot of neurodevelopmental disorders, a lot of the children do present with a lot of similarities across different developmental disorders. And I guess it's perhaps not trying to categorise on the basis of a diagnosis, but perhaps think more actually well, what are the processes that might be contributing to this and what function is it serving for these children. And I, th I think that's the angle that we're trying to approach this problem of the heterogeneity from, is rather than being exclusive, is perhaps to be more inclusive and see actually well, what disorders does it present across and what are those commonalities rather than necessarily the differences. Well, I'd like to comment on this and perhaps go beyond the um, the actual papers and to some of the implications. And one of there are several issues that I think are quite important. And one of them is that the distinction between what the neurologist would uh, call stereotypy and what others might call tick disorders, which are also a form of stereotypy. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the problems in the distinction is the idea of premonitory sensations and the assumption, which is throughout the literature, that, for example, high-functioning autistic children are doing their stereotypic behaviors without purpose and unable to describe the imagination that might be associated and also that uh, there is no premonitory sensation associated with stereotypic movement disorder. 
and that's a distinction from ticks in which premonitory sensations are said to be typical after a certain age. So I think that's partly a function of one's experience and time available in talking to the autistic children and with children with stereotypic movement disorder. I think it is probably true, although I hesitate uh, to be dogmatic about it, that the premonitory sensations are more easy to elicit in children with Tourette syndrome mm -hmm. than the children with stereotypic movement disorder. But I do not agree that that is a hard and fast distinction. Mm. Well, that's one of the issues which I think bedevils the entire field. And the other one that I want to mention, which didn't come out in the commentary or in your paper, as I recall, is that there is an overlap of a certain kind between tick disorders and stereotypic movement disorder in terms of the likelihood of them being uh, diagnosed. So that, for example, more recently we've found that quite a number of children with stereotypic movement disorder, w once they have that diagnosis, uh, people miss the fact that they may have tics as well or vice versa. Uh -huh. There's quite a number of children I've been seeing since I started out mostly with children with Tourette's is that stereotypies have been missed in the history of the children. In other words, it's assumed that earlier stereotypic patterns were tics, and that's it because people are satisfied with the diagnosis. I've even seen a child referred for a refractory treatment of Tourette's who never had Tourette's by a specialist, which was quite surprising because the child clearly never had tics. So one of the things that hasn't been done is to distinguish children who have stereotypic movement disorder with or without tics. And children with tics with or without stereotypic movement disorder and to study them separately, both in terms of outcome and other features. Oh. So that, that, until that's done, although the overlap has been noted, they haven't really been studied properly. I no. think that would be a very fruitful area for clarification. Yeah, and I definitely agree with you on all of those points. In terms of um, thinking about that kind of comorbidity between children with tics and stereotypy, so a couple of the children that were reported in the sample had comorbid tics as well. And we do often see it when actually in the clinic when, when you're kind of managing the tics and then the stereotype movements are, are then perhaps also present and, and thinking actually, well, how do we disentangle the ticks from the stereotypes so that they can be managed appropriately in their separate ways. Because I guess one of the things that we try to do with the ticks is try to encourage children to to engage in habit reversal strategies, perhaps, if the ticks are bothersome, and, and so they can gain more control over them. Um, but at the same time, we're not wanting families to, to kind of suggest them and, and give them lots of talks and prompt them around the ticks. You know, one other thing, because I'm excited by this entire field because there's much to be discovered in oh. every aspect. And one of the things which really surprised me, and uh, I'm sure everyone is aware that the definitions even of ticks uh, have problems. For example, the idea that ticks are always sudden and rapid is not necessarily correct for all ticks. And in some cases, we cannot be sure whether something is a tick or not. And I have had children, for example, grow up and come back and tell me that they had fooled me because in thinking about it themselves, they think that all of their ticks were compulsions in terms of uh, the distinction there. But, you know, the idea that ticks are associated with negative feelings and stereotypic movement disorder, as we are discussing, tends to be associated with positive feelings is also not that straightforward. I was no. surprised to find a number of children with Tourette syndrome who, when asked if they had the opportunity, would they do away with all of their tics or is there some other feeling? Several of them said they would not do away with all of their tics. They actually have grown to like a few of their tics, which was quite a shock to me. I've seen so many cases. So almost in every aspect of our discussion, there are other aspects to be discovered, I think, if one approaches it properly and has enough time and interest. And that's one of the things that seems to be lacking in the sense that there's been little 
collaboration among the different groups because each of us will have a different way of obtaining our patients, different referral criteria. Mm -hmm. If you're running a neurology clinic versus neuropsychiatry or psychiatry, you will get different patients referred. This certainly happened during the time that we have become known as a center for stereotypic movements, that we are getting different kinds of cases as people learn about our interests. And I think one of the things that I'm finding most interesting about the children who are presenting with the stereotypes and also the tics is actually that kind of comorbidity with anxiety. And you kind of mentioned that very kind of obsessive nature of tics and it being quite hard to disentangle actually is it, is it an obsessive behaviour or is it more of a, of a tic-like behaviour and what actually is that difference and what's underpinning that from a cognitive or neuropsychological perspective. In terms of the kind of stereotype movements and the children perhaps engaging in these kind of intense imagery movements, I guess what's quite interesting is that actually it doesn't seem as though they're performing the movements to, to reduce any kind of anxiety or compulsive kind of way, whereas in a, an anxiety disorder it would be perhaps the function of the movement would be the compulsion to perhaps eliminate that kind of cognitive stimulation. But I guess what's quite interesting about these children is that it seems as though the movements in some way enhance the kind of thinking process. While some of the children are able to privatise and that the movements don't interfere and they can manage them in everyday life, We've got this other kind of subset of children who actually have quite a lot of difficulties privatising and they're not really very aware when they're going into their own world or engaging in these kind of intense imagery movements. And they give themselves set times to try and limit down what they're doing, but actually they find it very hard to then disengage at the end of that time period. So I guess what I'm kind of really quite intrigued and in thinking about a little bit further is, you know, that kind of compulsive nature. Or how does it kind of sit so that in one aspect... The, the compulsion and the, the motor behaviour serves to eliminate those cognitive processes, but actually, on the flip side, in these children's stereotypes, it seems to enhance it in some way. And I think that's quite an interesting area that I'm, we're quite keen to, to try and explore a little bit further. I guess yeah. there's inter integrated mechanisms there. One of the things that surprised me is when I first started seeing some of these children who were referred from neurology, mm. is that they told me that they had... I've been seeing these patients for years, but never wrote them up, never made a collection of cases, and so there was very little written. Hmm. The opportunity tended to be lost, and we have more time, actually, with our arrangements to see patients than the neurologists do. So, therefore, indulging my penchant for listening to patients and seeing if I've missed something is something I can do uh, quite freely, whereas the neurologists have difficulty doing this. Mm -hmm. And issues like this, like who refers to whom and what kind of uh, approach to patients and routines are sanctioned and so on, seems to me to be quite important. So when one reads the literature, I think all of that you know, has to be taken into account. The other thing is that although in a children's hospital, from the standpoint of outpatient services, we can continue to see patients forever. We can't admit them to our hospital. Mm -hmm. So I can see patients who are now in their 20s or 30s without any problem, and that's fully covered. And so uh, I have seen some patients or found out through families about people who have stopped their stereotypy, and certainly publicly, mm -hmm. but also privately, and then resumed it later for various reasons and under different circumstances. So the problem of the follow-up the developmental course is also extremely interesting because I now do have two cases that I think fit into the pattern of excessive fantasizing and time taken to do this later. Yeah. But for the majority, that isn't or does not seem to be the case. Yeah, and I, th I think clearly we haven't got the follow-up service at the moment for trying to identify some of those theories and that was just trying to link in you know, that adult to the child literature as to what might happen some of these children, I think very interestingly, for one of the children that came from La Sapienza, actually one of their follow-ups was with the child's older sister, who's actually in her early 20s, and she reported to her brother when he was kind of taking part in some of these assessments that actually she engages in these compulsive acts of fantasy, but she's never had the movements, but she spends a lot of time in her own kind of world creating these um, you know, complex fantasy worlds that she enjoys slipping in and out of. To, to kind of stimulate her when there's, when there's little else to hold her interest. And it wasn't impairing in her case. But I think it's just very interesting that she'd never really spoken about it before until the younger sibling was kind of going through this process and it kind of all emerged within the family. So, again, it, it kind of suggests there's something 
something more than just environmental situations and something that's underpinning in terms of genetics that might be making people a little bit more predisposed to some people to engage in these kind of, you know, complex cognitive acts of, of imagination to occupy themselves with or without stereotype movements. The family situations are extremely interesting, and I think everyone has remarked in recent years upon the possible genetic aspects. I see families now where several people have a history of stereotypic movement patterns, whether they continue in private or not. Mm -hmm. We found that virtually all of the the legally blind children who have grown up, um, we did a follow-up study of all of them, um, and reached out into the community and found them and then spent hours in their homes talking with them as young adults. They all continue stereotypic movements, but the ones who are socially successful have made it private, so they are generally not doing it in public. And mm-hmm. even I, doing much work with people who are blind years ago, failed to actually delve into the aspect of imagination associated with stereotypic movements at the time. You know, We observed them and talked about whether they were doing it, but not from their standpoint why. Yeah. And unfortunately, most of the people who are writing about stereotypic movements do not have extensive experience with early visual impairment and have largely left it out. But even more dramatic is the statements made typically about sensory deprivation and a complete misunderstanding about people who are deaf versus people who are blind. There is no evidence from my extensive experience or the literature that I can find actually validating frequent stereotypic movement patterns in people who are early deaf cases Mm -hmm. rather than those who are blind. Having worked in an unusual institution years ago with both blind children and deaf children, there certainly was great concern about stereotypic movements in blind children, but I've rarely, if ever, seen anyone with deafness who has had significant stereotypic movements. Yeah. There is one paper in the literature which is quoted frequently without actually reading the contents, which points out that, in fact, there's a huge difference in the occurrence. So it's not just sensory deprivation in general. Mm-hmm. There's a big difference between whether that's visual or auditory. Yeah, and I think that's fascinating because I think one of the things that we're thinking about in terms of these imagery children or, or where our thoughts have been going is very much actually what's underpinning it and is it kind of a verbal imagery or a visual imagery or what function is that kind of imagery taking? And we've done some ongoing um, neuropsychological, some more in-depth assessments of some of these children and it seems as though for many of the cases they're actually quite high functioning across both verbal and visual domains with very good memory abilities which just kind of makes sense obviously, in terms of the recall of his episodes. But then for some other of the children, we've actually had one child who's got a non-verbal learning disorder, but actually so her verbal abilities are still very good, but actually everything else is very poor. And we've got the opposite as well, so dissociation with a child who's got very poor verbal abilities, but actually his perceptual processing abilities are very high. So far, we've not actually identified a child who's got a learning disability that's global and engaging in these movements. But I guess we're not kind of thinking that child's that's not out there. But I guess it's just trying to think actually what's those combinations of processes that might contribute to to the visual kind of side of things being more important and and what kind of function is it really serving? Because I think whilst it's serving the process of alleviating boredom, which is clearly what the children report to us at times, all the children have seen so far actually have quite a slow processing speed and, and difficulties with attentional shifting and some executive flexibilities. So it kind of suggests there might be something to do with that difficulty perhaps sustaining attention to external stimuli and, and that ease of switching between you know the real world and their own world it might be underpinning it in some way. But whether or not that's linked predominantly to verbal or, or visuospatial kind of memory abilities or processes seems to be open to the individual child. And I think one of the other things that we've kind of found is that in addition to being at times of boredom, there are children who are engaging in these movements actually when they're very anxious. You know, they are the ones that we're offering treatment to predominantly, are the ones who not only engage in the movements and the imagery when they're bored, but also when they're feeling threatened in social situations, they'll kind of engage in the movements and, and the imagery because it helps calm them down.
Um, but obviously that's a bit counterintuitive because in terms of their social development, it's obviously making them a little bit more abnormal to their peers and um, interfering in their interactions rather than actually aiding them as they're hoping it will by helping them calm down and be able to to think more appropriately about their engagement processes, which is what they're trying to do, what they report to us that they're trying to do. And so those are the children that are trying to work, but obviously what we're doing in those situations is trying to teach them better anxiety strategies or strategies to alleviate their worries rather than their stereotypes. Well, if I can just make a couple of comments on this fascinating subject. One of the things that you brought up in your paper, which I have difficulty with, is the question of whether one should try to suppress these Mm. movements beyond what the children might do themselves. And we found that our parents tend to be concerned, as you said, almost always about the future stigmatization and bullying that may occur and so on, whether it does or not, even when the children are very, very young. So that's not really an issue, I I think, at all. But the question of whether one should identify triggers, which are interesting in themselves, for these episodes and attempt to minimize the opportunity to reinforce this pattern by avoiding, if one can, those trigger situations and so on, it raises the question of the follow-up and the outcome. Mm. How often is it true that the adult status of these people is problematic versus not, and what what routes that, that does this follow? And so we have only limited opportunities to make a comment upon this. I don't know from talking with family members who are now adults that in many cases this is a problem for them. In some cases, it's actually an advantage. I have a situation with a surgeon father who has been doing this kind of pattern from the time he was young and obviously not during surgery, I might add, fortunately. (laughs) But when he has two children, both of whom have stereotypic patterns, the problem is that the mother has grown up in a situation where any kind of abnormality was really shameful. Mm -hmm. To have children who are doing this is devastating for her, whereas for the father, this is actually a positive thing because he feels that engaging in stereotypic behaviors actually helps his problem solving and Mm. he's regarded it as a positive feature. So they're entirely different, the two parents, in how they respond to this and consequently this is a problem for their children as to what you do say, um, how you respond when they do this and so on. It's really interesting to see those cases in which family members who are adults without having had a diagnosis, of course, in their early days, how they're responding to this in their families now. And it's quite diverse. Mm -hmm. So that's also something that we need to think about. And personally, I don't know whether we should generally try to suppress this or not. I mean, we found that with the children with Tourette's, we now know something about the idea that suppression is actually a good feature Uh, Children who, for example, try to suppress their tics in school, this probably helps them compensate neurologically Mm. in their development, whereas in the past the attitude was quite different. So I think we still don't know enough about these groups of children, and we're going to learn a lot more. But I would certainly like to see more collaboration amongst the different groups because the very fact that we obtain our patients differently is probably an advantage if developed properly in our collaborative efforts. Yeah, I think um, we're definitely very keen to develop collaborations, especially considering that very valid point of how patients are obtained and and whether or not they're coming through a psychiatry or neurology clinic and even the differences between obviously being an American and being in the UK and how those patients kind of come through our services. Clearly our sample's bias. We're a tertiary level centre. You don't get through to us without perhaps having seen some other people first or there being ongoing queries. And I know just from having spoken to other colleagues who work in our departments that actually they know of children who are engaging in these movements but obviously have sought no help because actually they're not impairing and they're not getting in the way. And when they've spoken to them, they have got imagination going at the same time, but it's just not a problem. So I think there is a huge range, isn't there, as 
with many disorders, whether or not the stereotypes and the image episodes are actually problematic as to whether or not actually they're, they're adaptive and functional. And I think the way in which we're kind of working at the moment is going from a very clinical perspective of actually if it's impairing in some way or if it's causing a social disadvantage to the child in some way, if there's comorbid anxiety, very often those are the things that we're treating and trying to help them manage with consideration of these movements and these episodes and how they might also be contributing to the problems rather than selectively focusing on children with these intense imagery movements and just trying to treat and stop them doing it because clearly it's enjoyable and why would you want to stop a child doing something they find quite enjoyable and it doesn't seem to be harmful in any way other than it might interfere in terms of some of that social interactions. But I think, like you've said quite a few times, by the time the children get to secondary school, for many of them, from the sample that we've seen, actually most of them have privatised or they just need a little bit of support and they're, they're able to, to kind of go, actually, I don't want to do this this time because I kind of want to be playing with peers, but I'm quite happy doing it this time when I'm at home and, you know, I still find it enjoyable. And I think we've got a couple of children who stopped doing the movements but actually still have the thoughts going on. So there's that slight association as well between those two processes that we're seeing a bit earlier on. But again, what their development trajectory looks like and what that pathway is like for some of these children and as they move into adulthood and, and perhaps some of those adults compulsive fantasizes where they perhaps came from to begin with, I think they're all really interesting questions. We definitely need to be combining samples and thinking more broadly in terms of the functions and, and the management to try and answer some of these questions because at the moment it just feels there's so many questions with so few answers because actually stereotypes and children with stereotypes haven't really been studied in detail or systematically in any way that you can disentangle the literature to make it more meaningful and move past just the presenting movements, which is why I think it's quite an exciting area to to kind of be looking at because obviously there is a lot of work to be done and a lot of information that I think we'll be able to gain in terms of thinking about the, the development of the brain and the interactions between different neural systems in the brain and especially that interaction between the motor and the cognitive system and perhaps how those thought processes might contribute to some of those sensory motor functions. I think there's a lot of questions there that perhaps some children along these lines might be able to help shed some answers on too. One final point. I think that this field leads us quite far towards exploring human behavior in general, the concepts of imagination, daydreaming, creativity, and so on. And just as we find that patients with tics, adults with tics for years, often do not observe or are unaware of some of their tics, people with stereotypies often are not aware of all of their stereotypies. And in some cases, for example, something like uh, respiratory patterns, vocalizations, and so on, they may be aware of an aspect of their stereotypy, but not all aspects of it, which itself is interesting in people who've been doing it for years. And in some cases, some of this may be regarded as just their mannerism or peculiarity. But even the aspect of some repetitive common behaviors, people's awareness of them, and I'm not thinking of a diagnosis of stereotypic movement disorder, many repetitive movements in humans and in animals have been inadequately studied mm. in terms of what we would consider normal and what the functions may be. We've now come to the end of our podcast. Many, many thanks indeed to both Dr. Robinson and Professor Freeman. Just remind our listeners that the article is entitled Intense Imagery Movements, a Common and Distinct Pediatric Subgroup of Motor Stereotypies by Robinson et al. in the December 2014 issue.